And since we have no animal welfare items on the agenda, we have, uh, we have a little guest. And if anyone has any interest in adopting this little kitten, um, contact our office. One of our staff is fostering it for the next three weeks, and then it will be available for adoption. I think this one is just under three weeks old. So it's currently being bottle fed uh, by my staff. <laughs> and I'm going to suggest that we put item seven and eight on consent without objection. On item 7, we would approve the exemption. Item 8, we would note and file that report on consent. And uh, otherwise, uh, let us start with uh, item number 1. Item number 1, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of one senior project coordinator and four project coordinators for the Los Angeles Housing Department pursuant to Charter Section 1001B. Uh, this matter is scheduled for council tomorrow. Okay. And uh, I believe something akin to this was uh, was passed once before. So I wonder if uh, CLA or anyone wants to tell us why it's back before us. Yes, Councilman Koretz, this item was previously before you. Uh, the positions were approved once before, but the exemption did not come through the normal process of the mayor submitting the exemption. Uh, this is actually the mayor's request to have council exempt these employees. So these are one and the same that you've approved, but this is just going through the regular process. And uh, does exempting these positions allow former CRA employees to apply? Uh, yes, it does. How likely do you think it is that some of the former CRA employees uh, apply for this position? I think it's very likely. Uh, we reached out to Mr. Steve Kofroth from the union who represents him, and um, he indicated that he'll work with us on advertising, and he has some of their Facebook accounts, so it's very likely they'll be able to get these advertisements. Very good. Mr. Zion, any fiscal questions? impacts none? Who's going to pay for it? It was submitted as part of the budget, so we'll see when we receive the draft budget on Monday um, if the funding was allocated for that, but it should be part of the budget. For 1314? 1314. Okay, thank you. Very good. If there's no further questions, uh, we'll approve the exemptions uh, without objection. Thank you very much. Item number two. Item 2, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of two utility rates and policy specialist two positions of the Office of Public Accountability pursuant to Charter Section 1001B1. This matter is also scheduled for council uh, tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, Bill Koenig with the CAO's office. Uh, Dr. Pickle could not attend the committee meeting this afternoon. He is actually in the Water and Power meeting discussing some issues that are specifically his responsibility. So he asked me to s sit in and answer any questions. What you have in front of you is a request from the mayor's office to exempt two of his four technical positions. Uh, this personnel department has reviewed this and concurs. Uh, we believe it's the best course of action at the present time, consistent with the intent of the Charter Amendment, which created his operation, to provide the greatest amount of flexibility and independence. <clears throat> uh, just out of curiosity, technically, does the ratepayer advocate report to the mayor or to the council or to both, or has that been decided? Uh, who, who has the priority there? The best person would be the city attorney to answer that question. It is unique. He was appointed by a citizens committee confirmed by the mayor and council. He reports to the Water and Power Commission but receives no instruction from the commission. It is quite unique. From, from an administrative standpoint of view, we have presumed that he follows the rules and regulations for a general manager that reports to both mayor and council. 
Okay. But that is, that is our interpretation. It is not the city attorney. So I would suggest that maybe the city attorney directly answer your question. Are you saying that that's your interpretation because you already have an opinion from the city attorney? No, no, no. Just from the administrative standpoint of view, just the way, the way business is being conducted. Uh, there's, but the form, question has not been formally requested of the city attorney, to my knowledge. And so I, I don't know if the city attorney has an opinion on this yet, because it probably hasn't been, hasn't been approached earlier. That wouldn't be a bad idea, so why don't we ask that you do that? But obviously not to, to hold up this item. Mr. Zion, any questions? Salary? Salary of these positions? The salary is, is approximately that of a senior management analyst, too. Numbers? Uh, I believe it's about 135000 a year. And where are they going to be housed? In the OPA's office, which at present is at Figueroa Plaza. In existing facilities? Correct. City facilities. Um, money's going to be coming out of the Water and Power Department? Pardon? The Water and Power Department's going to pay for this? The, it says it, fiscal impact. No. They will be reimbursed by the Department of Water and Power. Uh, the city annually would be building Water and Power for these costs. Okay. And how many more positions are they seeking? There are a total of four technical positions with the communication in front of you at the present time. It addresses two of those. And then we can just pay two more, and that will be the completion the, for Dr. The two Kimmel. others have been incorporated into an administrative ordinance that was approved by the council approximately two weeks ago that will become effective uh, in the beginning of May, in the middle of May. So, so in essence, all four of his technical positions would, in fact, be exempted once the uh, time has passed. So Dr. Pickle will have a staff of four. Correct. And then he won't have to keep going to the private consultants that he's no, I think there will still be an occasional need for private consultants on certain items that, for example, specialty things, short-term issues. He reserves the right to be able to utilize that if necessary. And then what's the annual budget for the ratepayer advocate? For the current year's budget is approximately a million to direct cost. I, I don't remember the indirect costs on that. And then next year it will be higher, I assume? Slightly higher. It's, uh, the mayor's the request that was submitted to the mayor is basically a continuation at the current level. And then that will come out of DWP fees? Correct. This is consistent with other activities where the city, the general fund, finances the activity, and then bills are submitted to the proprietary department six times a year for reimbursement. <coughs> so we get the money after it's spent? I'm sorry? We get the money after it's spent. There's no Correct. Note on it. Correct. But there, we, we bill six times a year. So it's not as though we wait until the end of the year for full recovery. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Alarcon, uh, item number two uh, on uh, DWP uh, ratepayers advocate uh, exemptions. Do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, all right. That item will pass uh, without objection. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for the record, uh, uh, Councilmember Alarcon has uh, come in as of the vote on item number two, and uh, he'd like to be added on to item number one and uh, I believe the consent calendar, item seven and eight. Okay, let's do the, uh, the third exemption item, uh, item number six. Item number six, Community Development Department report relative to requests for exemptions pursuant to Charter Section 1001D4 for six grant funded positions. Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, are these positions resolution authority positions or ongoing positions? The resolution authority positions. And, and who's providing the grants for these positions, and how these long are, are the grants for? These are Workforce Investment Act funds, so they're uh, uh, currently funded for, for the two years. 
we get an allotment from the Workforce Investment Act in two-year increments. And when the funding runs out, are we able to apply again, or do we expect this is it? Oh, these, are the, these are the formula funds that support our uh, workforce development services throughout the city. So this is an ongoing source of revenue from the federal government. Oh, okay. Very good. Yes. Any questions, Mr. Alarcon? Mr. Zion? So how many will this take us? Uh, we have a certain number of charter exempt positions. What will this take us to? Uh, this is exempt from the charter exemptions. These are actually grant-funded activities. I believe what you're referring to is um, a different uh, section, 10.01A. Uh, but under 10 d there is, there is an exemption. We don't fall under that exemption. So this is grant funding. When the grant runs out, the positions run out? When the grant runs out, we hopefully we have secure additional revenue to continue on with the positions. We've been fairly successful in, in doing that. Okay. Do you know where we are on the other schedule, on the, on the uh, other positions, the exempt positions? What number we're at? 140. No. 140? We can go to 150? Pardon me? Well, our total is 150. Right. So we're 10 away from maxing out. Yes. If there's no other questions, uh, that will pass as well. Without objection, we'll adopt, adopt the uh, approve the exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number four. Yeah, I'm going to do four and five, which are both DWP items. Three. And we'll come back to three. For item four, it's Rose Garcia with the Director of Labor Relations for Water and Power. My name is Joe Castrita, Director of Water Distribution, Water and Power. I'm Eileen Liu. I'm with the Power System of Water and Power. Okay. On item number four, uh, what exactly is the proposed salary range for the water services manager? The salary range is 9669 It's uh, which is the equivalent of $96.99 hourly rate per step. It maxes out about 250000 a year. And what are the duties, and why is the salary set so high? The salary is actually set exactly like it was before, equivalent to the general services manager. This position was a general services manager position. That personnel department reallocated to a new classification as a general service, I mean, excuse me, as a water services manager. It's a different title, same same salary, and it was because of the new requirements for the regulatory requirements for the uh, water certification. Uh, the duties have not changed, it's just additional requirements, of which no longer made this classification interchangeable with general services manager. So the position, in essence, hasn't changed, there's just a few additional requirements. Additional certifications. Okay. Um, Besides approving the salary, does the committee need to formally approve requests to amend the MOU between the DWP and the MEA or, or Actually, no? Actually, the Board of Water and Power Commissioners will approve the, MO, the amendment of the classification and adoption of the classification into the MOU. But yes, the Board, the Council has to approve the classification and then set the salary for that classification. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Zion? Uh, $250,000 plus benefits? That's correct. Is this comparable with the real world? we ever analyze that? It's comparable with the utility industry. That's the real world, the utility industry? With the real world they, they work in. That's what the salary level is? Yes, it is. Okay. Mr. Alarcon, anything? So uh, if I am making the correct motion, we would adopt the DWP request and approve going forward with the MOU amendment. Does that sound correct? That sounds correct. Okay. Well, we will do that without objection. Uh, item number five. Item number five, LADWP report relative to salary setting for chief of drafting operations, class code number 7271, duties descriptive record 95-72713. And uh, I would just ask, what are the duties of the Chief of Drafting Operations? And again, why is the salary set at, at such a high amount? The classification used to exist in Water and Power, and the position was actually um, abolished at Water and Power several years ago when we decentralized, several, like over 10 years ago, when we decentralized the drafting operations. 
we then brought the drafting operations back centralized um, after we, deregulation didn't happen. Um, the salary we determined to be equivalent to our full engineers because of the span of control. This position supervises 115 employees. It also supervises seven different divisions or sections um, and four different disciplines. It's one, we, we used to, the position when we had it before had two pay levels. We determined it only needed one pay level since we centralized it. And it was going to supervise all four disciplines, electrical, mechanical, architectural drafting, civil drafting. Um, the duties is a manager. It's a manager supervising the four disciplines and 115 employees. Equivalent with our the span of control of what we considered what we were, a full engineer. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, I would move that we uh, adopt the DWP request and move forward with the MOU amendment uh, once again. Thank you. And then the last item is item number three. Item number three, CO report and city attorney report and ordinance relative to the establishment of salary range for executive director of the Los Angeles Convention Center. Speaker Fernandes in CAO's office. I wonder if you could walk us through walk us through this very briefly. The city council approved a motion on December twelfth that asked the CAO and the C city attorney to look at basically enhancing the governance structure of the convention center. So it's three parts to that. There was one, a motion to go out with an RFP to get a private management firm. The second component was to get an executive director. Currently there's a general manager. So the duties were changed and enhanced to an executive director. The Civil Service Commission approved the title change and the duty description on January 24th. And the third component is a board of commissioners that will have uh, you know, less um, timelines with the booking process and that thing. So this is one of the components for the executive director position. Now I know this, this position has greater job responsibilities in theory than the current general manager. Um, what specifically are, are significant enough to to warrant a very substantial increase in salary? Well, for this position, we did look at other convention centers. And so the vision for the convention center is to be comparable to, say, Las Vegas, San Diego, Anaheim. And those salary ranges, um, for San Diego, it's $320,000 that the current person in this position, executive director, is making at this time. So it's looking at actually just the industry standards and the practices for what the vision is and what this position is expected to do in increasing our tourism and market. Now, for us to be more competitive with Las Vegas and other places that currently do a lot better than our convention center, is it dependent upon the uh, uh, football stadium proposal and the expansion? Or even if that doesn't happen, are we still expecting to change our level of competitiveness and change the duties substantially. Yes, of course creating that stadium would be greater, but it's looked at just these separate components and increasing that asset of the convention center. And so having the right skill level for the executive director that has that tourism and the connection to actually bring in, you know, more conventions to it is just one big component of actually increasing that asset. So it's not dependent on the expansion. It no, this would be standalone. All three components working together with the stadium, you know, bigger and better, but this is a standalone. Okay. Mr. Alarcon, questions? I'm not understanding what you mean by standalone. The three components, when council approved the, they looked at three components. So they one looked at kind of just how can we enhance the governance structure for the convention center. So one of that was like, for example, our booking process takes 24 months, so council asked that it kind of be reduced to 12 months to kind of get rid of some of the, the timelines and that type of thing. So there was three things that was looked at. One was actually getting a board of commissioners that would oversee and that would work more closely with the tourism board. The other was actually increasing the skills and the duties and responsibility of the executive director for the general manager and also going out with the RFP. But those three things collectively, you know, makes it 
can increase it even more. However, even the executive director just by itself, if we increase the duties and the responsibility and, and actually make it focus more on the tourism, it is believed that this, too, will increase the asset for the convention center. Okay, but, okay. so I understand what you mean by standalone, but I, I'm not understanding how that answers the chairman's question, because I had the same question. Uh, is this is this what it's going to be even if the convention center is built? Yes, this would be even if, okay. yes. Okay. So I think his question, well, I perceived it to be, if that does not occur, would this still be something that's going to increase our asset right. and enhance the, the structure of the convention center? And yes, so we believe that even if those other components do not occur, if we, oh, if we, can, if we can actually increase... In other words, even if, even if the farmer's field goes away, we we still want to look at other opportunities for expansion. Yes, we still want to be comparable to San Diego and Anaheim and Las Vegas and, and actually increasing the salary and the duties and responsibility will allow us to do that. Now, is there also an endeavor to privatize the convention center? There is a current RFP that's out that actually would bring in the private management of it, still being the city's so asset. So how would that impact this position? Well, the, again, that's the same thing. So they looked at it both ways. So it's this, it was three components that were approved in December. So one was the RFP for the private management. The other was the executive director. And then the third is the governance board. There are still those motions that are in place with the RFP. It's still ongoing at this time. And there's still uh, some rewriting of the admin code and some ordinances that will change the, the board. However, the executive director, again, is, is also... It's like the first component to that. And so the RFP kind of outlined that if this occurred, of what the reporting structure would be. Okay, but so does this position disappear? This position would not disappear. Under any condition? Under any condition. Well, if we were to privatize the convention center, wouldn't we want them to pick their person? The, and, of course, it could change with council approval. However, the, the idea in the RFP laid out that there would be three components with, if the private management firm went. So it would be three components. The executive director would still be there, still, still a city employee. So the position would be there, but not necessarily the person. Well, the person would be there as well. Once they appoint the ED that has the skills and expertise, the, if you look at the RFP, it actually outlined that there would be a board that would work with the tourism board, there would also be this executive director piece that would work with the tourism and the private management firm would actually work in conjunction or report to this ED, but separately, and the ED would then report to the mayor and council. So the executive director would, would sort of oversee the, the private management firm that we would hire with the RFP. Yes, it as is. As opposed to the reverse, they would never be hiring the executive director. Exactly. Even with even with the private management firm, I mean, out the way that the RFP laid it out is that there would still be a small group with the ED that would actually oversee those functions. That's design. Well, <clears throat> if you look at the activities in Anaheim, Las Vegas, San Diego to the LA Convention Center, where are we in that scale? How close to the bottom? It is my understanding, and I, I am not a convention center expert, however, and, and just looking at, they had more shows, more, it was more focused on, on tourism, they had hotels, they had a lot of things that were going on in conjunction with just the convention center and the regular shows that come to our convention center yearly. So this position is getting that expertise that can actually get us to that level and actually be focused on the tourism and, and, and getting some of those. But isn't that what the tourism and the TOT tax, the hotel bed tax, goes to the Convention Visitors Bureau to market, to bring people in? Yes, the city does have that contract, but this is actually getting somebody that actually works for the city. It's a city employee that has that, that expertise and skill that we hope that will enhance our government structure and enhance the convention center and make it more of a worldwide. And then this person will hire people to do the job, but direct the activities. She reminds me of what we did with the parking lots, where we were going to take our parking lots, get $50 million for the budget, and we put a bunch of restrictions and it went nowhere. Uh, when I look at the salary request, 
it was 104 9 to 223. They were going to take it from 210 to 315. And who knows if we're going to do better or worse than we are now? Because well, whoever gets the spot is going to hire a staff, and there's more expense, and the convention has always been in a deficit. Well, two things. Um, one, what you're approving is just the salary range. So with the general manager, they're on a salary range. So currently, the general manager is on the M8 salary range, which is 149 to 223. So this is approval of moving actually just the range to be 210 to 315. When the mayor makes an appointment, it can be anywhere in that range. So it does not have to be at the higher end. It's just to hire anything over, you know, 223 we need to move it to another range. So that's what this is basically doing, to give, just giving that, that scale to be able to So we're obviously not hiring the guy from San Diego. I, I do not know. I do not have that information. However, uh, as far as staffing, it is not um, that, that we would go hire more staff. We already have um, staff at the convention center. And so if there was a private management company that, that came in, um, some of the staff may transition, some of the staff may stay with the city, and so it, it is believed that there will be a core group that would stay and work under this executive director position. But it seems bizarre that we're going to hopefully, maybe someday, have a joint public-private partnership, yet we have a person that is a city employee that is going to be in charge when the private sector may have a whole different agenda. We have this individual who says this way. I want it done. I, I think there's a, I think there's a conflict. Well, they wouldn't actually be over the actual private management firm. And again, this would be a position that would be there even if the private management did not occur. However, the way that the RFP laid it out and what was approved in December by council actually covered that it would be three components and that it would be a private management firm, but that it would be an executive director for the for the administration portion of it with a very small core group of employees. We're talking less than, than five or so. And then creating the board that would actually just enhance the governance section. That's if the RFP, you know, goes on. This is actually just the executive director, so it could be if, if, if it did not come to the RFP and a private management firm, you'd still have the executive director there. I, I wonder if you could walk us through how they came to that conclusion, because I know there was a lot of study done. Um, how they conclude that that was the best Government's governance structure? Well, that was in a council file that was approved in December, and actually I was not involved in that, so it would probably be the, the ones that were actually wrote the RFP and worked with uh, to carry out that vision for it. I would have to report back to you. So you don't know what kind of study they did, to, et cetera, I do come not. to that conclusion? Uh, you know, what amazes me is I was at the LAPD Communications Center. There are 58 dispatch are short. They don't have mechanics at the garage. They don't have mechanics at the fire department. Uh, we have uh, fiscal problems, and we're given a substantial increase to a position that may be a joint public-private partnership. I don't know if 149,000 to 223 is substantial enough to attract someone, or we have to increase that when we're not taking care of our employees or filling positions that are critical the services for Los Angeles. The fiscal impact says none, but someone's paying for that. So who's paying for it? Well, currently it would be in the convention center's current budget, and that's why there was no no fiscal impact that it would, wouldn't be needed or more funds needed for this fiscal year. Um, so it would come from the convention center funding. Are they within budget, below budget, over budget? Um, I I cannot be probably the budget people that would be best to answer that question. Well, see, my question, if they're running a deficit, then all we're doing is adding to that deficit. I don't know why we couldn't get somebody between 149 and 223. I mean, if you're talking about Anaheim, which obviously has a lot more conventions than Los Angeles, they're at 175,000. And then Vegas and San Diego, obviously higher. But I just have a problem with how we're going to pay someone if we're going forward with a joint public-private and this position stays in place, yet we have the TOT that pays for LA Visitors Bureau to go out and generate activity for conventions. And it would be interesting to see if we're moving positive or negative. I think the biggest thing that they have with the conventioners is the auto show. That's once a year for about a week. 
the rest of the time, there's little activities, but not a lot of activities, which then you don't fill up the hotels. And we have more going out in salary benefits than we have coming in. Maybe you can answer that. Well, I mean, I, you know, that's, that's the whole reason why we want to have somebody who is an executive director so that we can start bringing those, those trade shows and those conventions into Los Angeles and not have everything go to San Diego and Anaheim. And I'm sure you see in the paper all the conventions that happen in Las Vegas and Anaheim and San Diego. We want to bring some of that business here to the city so that we can increase the revenue that is generated by this, uh, this asset that we have sitting there that isn't generating as much revenue as we would like. Um, so in order to attract somebody of that caliber, we need to pay a little bit more. Um, Doesn't so the Tourism Bureau, what Mark Lieberman used to be at, isn't that what they're responsible for? Well, maybe you can answer that, Sharon. Because they have the TOT goes that. for that. They get a lot of money from the TOT. Yeah, I, I think that when this issue was first heard by council, um, well, not first heard, but when it was heard in December, um, one of the issues raised with regard to um, – the Convention Tourism Bureau, whatever, I think they have a new name now, LA Inc. was what they used right. to be called, um, that they were operating separately from our management structure. And that was one of the things that the intent of moving forward with the consolidated three-prong approach that CAO is referring to was trying to coordinate all of that better. One of the, th the troubles that we're having with the Convention Center right now is while they are bringing in revenue, there is still a rather significant general fund subsidy that is going into the convention center. So there, the whole purpose of going forward and trying to have a consolidated, coordinated approach, one of which is to improve the management structure. Um, having this ex executive director kind of coordinating all of that. Um, having the, uh, a new board that's vested with new authorities. Changing some of the policies with regard to booking. One of the pr troubles with booking is that, um, I think one of the things that was mentioned by CAO is that there was a 24-month um, window. And what happened was when you have a 24-month window, it inhibited the ability to book those, some of those conventions. It was booked out so far in advance that we couldn't get the conventions where most of the revenue would be generated. Um, trade shows don't do as much for our local economy as some of the major conventions when you have you know, overnight stays when they are eating in our restaurants and, and, and that type of thing. So this is part of a coordinated, consolidated approach. We can certainly have further discussion um, as this comes forward. This is um, simply setting the salary for one employee. Um, it, there is a wide range for that salary. It may not come in at the higher level. It could very well come in at the lower level. Um, we just don't know until we actually go out and look for that individual. It's going to be based on, you know, the experience of that individual and, and where that individual comes from and that type of thing. So, you know, this, this is a small piece of a coordinated approach. Now, just for the record, I, I will note that uh, I thought that all of these very substantial changes uh, might be enough to dramatically change the fact that we're a somewhat underperforming convention center and convention city. Um, we decided to go ahead with privatizing the convention center as well, which I thought was sort of putting the cart before the horse. And when we had this in budget committee, I suggested that we do all these other steps, but don't do the privatizing step at the same time, wait and see whether all these other things take care of uh, our shortfall and our are needing a general fund subsidy. Um, I wasn't successful in convincing many council members, so that's why we're also going ahead with the RFP to privatize. Um, but I think these are all very positive steps. I just don't know whether the last step is necessary of privatizing the convention center, but actually trying to hire a more experienced uh, executive director um, and giving the flexibility the salary range, I think, uh, makes a lot of sense. That part, I think, is, is a critical first step. We could certainly have, if there's a general fund subsidy, what's that number? How much are we subsidizing? Other than the bonds that we're trying to pay off, how much are we subsidizing? I believe the bonds are being covered. Um, I think it, and because the, rev the revenue that's coming off the convention center is somewhere in the 20 to $30 million range. I think the overall cost of the convention the whole operation is probably somewhere in the 
60 to $70 million range. So I think the subsidy may be somewhere between, I'm pulling these numbers out of the air, but I think it's somewhere in the range of 10 to $20 million. So we're already running the deficit, which is no secret. And we want to bring someone in at an increased salary to market it. At the same time, we got LA Business Prevention Bureau marketing, and there might be a public private partnership down the road. Well, we can't get somebody for um, two hundred and ten thousand dollars, two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. Well, we again, we did look at you know the salary for San Diego, Las Vegas, Anaheim. We also did work with um, an agency that actually looks at the salaries and the duties, and and to try to let us know what the salaries would be to get somebody that can actually turn the convention center into the economic engine. Are those, are those public private partnerships for? Of the ones that I've mentioned, there I, I'm not sure about uh, Anaheim, but there are there's one that that is a partnership. I think Which it's San one? Diego. San Diego. So um, they have a they have a, the same kind of staffing structure as you've described for this position. Well, this salary was also to keep in mind with our with our current. Suit. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the comparison with this other jurisdiction. It doesn't compare administratively. Were there five other positions that were supervised? Were there, what is the size of, of their? Uh, I can I cannot tell you the staffing size. I can get back to you with that. I can tell you. Just we just looked at kind of what uh, the operations. I'm, I'm, were. I'm just. I, I'm not sure whether this is a good or bad idea. I'm just. I don't think I'm getting the explanation I need to to sell this. Um, and you you first said that that they were going to oversee the private partnership private. Uh, public partnership, but then you turned around and said they weren't going to oversee the public-private partnership. I'm not sure which one it is. Okay. I don't necessarily mean oversee. Of course, the, the private partnership no, I'm, I'm just saying what you said, because you literally said they were not going to oversee it, and they were going to oversee it. So I'm not sure what it is. Okay. And, if I and, can clarify. No, I'm not asking a question. Okay. The other The other thing that confuses me is when you say somebody making $300,000 is supervising five people as an a justification for this. Supervising five people doesn't justify anything to me for 300000 So I, I don't, I, you know, I voted for this thing too, and I, I think I think we're moving in the right direction, but I think the, the analysis here is is not what I need to, to, to sell this. Um, and and I, uh, I, I'd rather have it come back. Is there, is there some reason why we got to move, like, Today? Not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, we would like to bring somebody on board as quickly as possible. Um, to be, and they're not just going to be supervising five people. They're going to be overseeing the entire operations of the convention center, um, including the, the independent operator that, that may come in to, uh, to oversee. So they are overseeing. Yeah, I mean, they're overseeing the entire convention center operation. So we're looking for somebody who can come in and run a, a global... Tell me, what's the difference between the... What is the what is the private part of this? What are they bringing? They're going to run the actual operations. They're going to uh, you know do all of the the booking and the but this, uh, making but sure this that that convention is, center is is filled to the this greatest. This person is possible. going to be overseeing that. They're going to be overseeing the entire operations of the convention center, including the the, the private operator that's going to come in and and run it. I'm trying to think of an analogy that I can use. As yeah, that's, as, and, and so, uh, so the comparison to the other jurisdictions means nothing to me without knowing what their structure is. Well, when was the convention center opened? Long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. Yeah. And they've been in a deficit ever since they opened? No. They have not? No. No. When they had, they they had a deficit? few good years. They had some good years, yes. Um, it's been a while. Um, other than the Democratic 20, convention. maybe? 20 years it's been the, Dem uh, the Democratic convention brought a lot of people. That was probably the highlight. Well, it depends upon what you call a deficit. Because well, when, when they're spending more than they're bringing in, that's the deficit. Yes, but sometimes that there are other benefits that are accrued to city revenues that aren't counted toward the convention center, such, such as the, the TOT. You know, we get a lot of TOT monies 
and it may not necessarily be counted or credited to a convention. So I don't know whether you can say, when we say that the convention center may be running a deficit, you're looking strictly at very specific components of the revenue. Let me make a comparison. Staples, Nokia, LA Live. Are they running a deficit? Are they been running a cash flow positive since they opened? Uh, we, we are not privy to their books. Well, let me tell you their books. They're making a profit. It's no secret. They're making a profit. Private enterprise is making a significant profit. And what we're running is a deficit. Maybe 20 years ago we made a profit. That's the difference. They know how to run a business and make a profit. And sadly, we run a convention center, and we're still paying off the bond. And that's one of the financial problems we continue to have. And that's why the council approved this, this three-pronged approach, is to bring in an outside um, entity to run the convention center, bring in an executive director who can, who can um, the manage it. Um, the if Louis is available, he'd be perfect. Do <laughs> you think we can get him for 320? Yes. Somehow I don't think so. No. Who was the, the one who left? He went to the Phoenix House. He was the executive director. Oh. Uh, Poria. 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 I thought he got a rave reviews. Wasn't he in that position? Who? Poria. He was, he was the a general, general manager. manager of the convention center, yes. So we're trying to bring somebody to replace his position. That's correct. That's you currently correct. have an interim person, yeah, an general interim. manager. Poria hit. He did it. So how does this differ from his responsibilities when he was there? And he's gone on to bigger and better things. But he was there for a number of years. This one's going to make a profit. No. What's the we guarantee? Are. No guarantee. Yeah, that's my concern is we don't have a guarantee of anything other than we continue on the same path. We, we, we run the zoo a deficit. We run the convention center a deficit. Private sector comes in and makes a profit. However they're doing it, they're making a profit with union employees. That's, that's what, the frustrating that's, part. And that's what we're trying to do here. Well, in theory, with a with a higher salary range to attract someone, your downside is fifty to ninety thousand dollars a year in salary. Your potential upside is ten to twenty million dollars that we're in deficit. So, if this person brings much of an improvement, they cover their salary and considerably more. And that winning lottery ticket is out there. It's in my pocket right now. We <laughs> uh, haven't got it. Paul. There it is. <laughs> if wins, I'll donate half of it to the city. Oh, well. I, I still think that it's, it, it is more money with a question. You're going to go out there, who are we going to get, what are they going to do, and how do we monitor what accomplishments are going to be made? I, I think what the, what the CIO did say that, uh, that generally brings true is to hire, to target somebody with higher skill sets and levels of experience, and and that's that's the critical component. If we're going to change our operations, maybe somebody with experience in public-private partnerships, we don't have that. Um, I, I don't think the comparison to uh, Staples, Nokia, and and, uh, and uh, the other one you mentioned is fair. Totally different kinds of operations. Totally different kinds of operations. They have much more flexibility uh, to uh, do things like media and uh, advertising. But um, so so I get I get that what we're trying to do is increase the scope of the executive director uh, to uh, to increase the scope of our of our convention center activity. And therefore, generate more revenue. Um, I get that, and I have no problem with it. I just, I just, I was losing something in the explanation of what exactly that person was going to do. I'll give you another example: Coachella, stagecoach. You know who is the main party? Coachella and stagecoach, where they have eighty thousand people paying hundreds of dollars. AEG. They're the ones who. Facebook was last weekend and Coachella found in this. Well, you go to all the parties. Right no, I, I didn't go on this told time. that. And, and AEG told me that they're the ones who are uh, part of their fat portfolio. 80,000 people, hundreds of dollars. For no, overhead, no, no overhead, no building, no nothing. You 
you got a field. <laughs> a temporary stage. Polo ground. you got a polo ground. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. That's, that's just that creativity, and they're making loads of money. So. Now, now, when the executive director is hired, will they be hired in time to help oversee the RFP process or what's left of it? Um, or are they independent of that? Well, I, it would... If you approved it today, it would have to go to council, so it just depends on when that RFP process would end, but it's probably not likely that it would be during the time if it's moving forward. Well, uh, colleagues, what's your pleasure? Are you ready to move forward with this? Do you still have questions? I'm, I'm going to vote with the chair because you're going to be here. <laughs> well, I think although I, I have questions about parts of this whole process, uh, I don't really have any question about raising the salary range and trying to attract a, a stronger executive director. So uh, I, I would move that concept. Um, Absolutely, other part. <laughs> I, would, I would be happy to, to eliminate the RFP and bring it back in two or three years, but I don't think the council uh, is in sync with me on that one. So I will just move this item. Uh, uh, any objections? So. Okay, so we have a somewhat unenthusiastic but uh, unanimous uh, vote on that one. Okay, we have one speaker under public comments, uh, Monica Franklin. Um, my name is Monica Franklin. I'm with a company called Vice and Technologies, and we provide, um, we're an independent consulting company. We provide a cost analysis study. Uh, anything that has to do with credit cards and debit cards. So I had heard about the shelters, the animal shelters. Uh, we go in and we provide this service at no charge. Uh, there's no financial investment. We share in the newfound money, and I thought it would be a good way to, to help them. I brought some packets with me, and we also do work with several cities. So not on the agenda, but I'll just ask you for a second. So mm -hmm. what? I'm not clear on what what service you would be trying to offer for um, we go in city and we, shelters. Right. Um, I believe that they take credit cards and debit cards for uh, donations or licensing or whatever it may be. And uh, we provide an audit, auditing um, service. We have seven patents that work in the area of interchange optimization to verify and to make sure that uh, they are getting the correct rates, and uh, we go back and get refunds and, and fees for our clients. But if someone buys a license for $20, they charge on their credit card. What's your connection? How does that work? Well, um, when they charge it on the credit card, the, the merchant doesn't get the $20. He gets maybe $18. So there's fees involved. And depending on how that um, the merchant has... Um, your account set up, um, it could be correct or it could not be correct. I mean, we go in and we work with nonprofits today and we get money back for them. Um, we work with cities and we're getting money back for them. So, you money back to who? Uh, they're merchants, they're processors. We go back and, and get refunds and fees. You're suggesting that, that these merchants are not calculating properly? No. I'm suggesting that maybe when the account was set up, it wasn't set up completely. I mean, every year the a Visa, MasterCard puts out two new uh, fees per year, and uh, these changes may not always be adapted. Well, we'll take a look at your materials. It's certainly worth it. I the, put some uh, letters of recommendations in here um, from some of the uh, counties that we've worked with. As well as nonprofits. Hey, we're waiting for our city attorney to object. Hey, we're all, we're always looking for new efficiencies. So we're happy to look at this. Not taking any action. Taking any action. And we appreciate you coming and Thank making us aware of this service. Yeah, we'll get them. We'll get them. Sergeant Arf. Thank you. And I believe we have no other items on the agenda. So, with no further business, we are adjourned. <laughs>